No field of human endeavor would be more affected by railways than war. The great peacetime invention of the 19th century would become a deadly factor in the world wars of the 20th century. Railways linked battlefields to cities and factories and increased the scale of war far beyond anything that had gone before. Trains themselves would be part of the battlefield, both as targets and even as weapons. This armored train was a monster on rails, a colossus which certainly had a psychological impact, like the Stukas. First of all, they made a great impression on the enemy. A huge iron colossus bearing down on them, armor plated and bristling with cannon. The enemy were overwhelmed. Many film crews visited us to report about us in the newsreel. During the war, I was an engine driver. I had a military tunic, a military coat and boots. I had a star here. We received a military ration and we were well equipped. That's why we always got our supplies to the army on time. The Industrial Revolution that produced the railways also provided new and deadly mechanized weapons. Together, they would transform the shape of war. Before the railways, armies had lived off the land wherever they went into battle. Trains made it possible to move and supply vast numbers of troops over far longer distances at much greater speed. The first great battles over railways took place during the 1860s in the American Civil War. Here at Harper's Ferry in West Virginia was a key rail junction. Railways were so important to the war that they were frequently fought over. The bridge over the Potomac was destroyed nine times. It became a railroad war because the railroads were the invasion routes. And because they were, they were recognized. So they were used to fight the war, and they were ripped up to stop the other side from fighting the war. And right here is a historic place, because this is where Jackson entered on the world stage. Right here were two railroads and an arsenal. And Jackson, just a few hours after secession of Virginia, raided this arsenal. He took the guns, and he started to rip up the railroads for 100 miles. And Jackson was a greater robber of trains than Jesse James, for he stole the biggest bag in the war. He stole 57 locomotives and 335 cars and moved them south for the use of the South. Jackson and his fellow Confederates knew that the Unionists from the North had the twin advantages of industrial strength and superior rail links. Trains and tracks became the natural target for the Southern forces. My great-grandfather, General Stewart, recognized the importance of rail and the incredible impact it had on providing supplies to the Union forces. And at every opportunity, he was in the business of providing deep raiding parties into enemy territory with several objectives. One would be to destroy supplies, but another very important element was to break up or dissect or damage any lines of communications. That could be bridges, that could be rails, and he was very effective at destroying these rails and bridges as a part of these deep raids in enemy territory. As fast as the South destroyed tracks, the North repaired them. This bridge over the Potomac was rebuilt in just eight days. The final showdown of the war happened here at Petersburg in Virginia during the winter of 1864. Here, one of the lasting effects of the railways on warfare was revealed. The railways had this immense capacity to deliver arms and equipment, and above all, almost unlimited supplies of ammunition to a given spot, so that you could concentrate more fire 
on a battlefield for a longer period of time than ever before. And the only way to cope with that was by digging in. And it was this capacity of the railways to deliver that led to trench warfare, and a sort of prototype of the horrors of the First World War, what, 50 years later, came during the last winter of the American Civil War, between 1864 and 1865, round Petersburg in Virginia, when both armies dug in. The trenches at Petersburg were the shape of things to come. Winter made both sides all the more dependent on rain. The North sent in a steady flow of food and ammunition by train. With inferior links, the Southern supplies dwindled and their troops began to starve. The railways had spawned this new form of war. In Europe, too, trains began to play a central part in war. The quick Prussian victories over Austria and France in the 1860s and 70s owed much to the Prussians' rapid deployment of troops by rail. In the new German state, railways were now central to military planning, the ideal means of moving troops quickly to any border. From this point on, it was quite clear that in the future, everything would depend on making the best possible use, the fastest possible use of the railways, of using them to the maximum capability in order to start the war as soon as possible with the maximum number of people possible and with the maximum amount of supplies possible. So after 1870, there was no more any doubt in anybody's mind that the railways were the way to go. There was a tendency for General Staff to send the most capable people, what the Germans called the best horses we have in our stable, into the railway departments in order that they might sort out this enormously complex and enormously uh, delicate uh, instrument. Alfred von Schlieffen spent 15 years drawing up a timetable for total mobilization of the German army by rail. He calculated the number of wagons that would pass over every bridge every hour of a two-week mobilization period. Four million men, all their food and ammunition. Each man, each horse, each gun carriage assigned their own place in one vast war machine. By 1914, all that was needed was the signal to act. Das war am dritten Mobilmangelstag im August 1914. It was day three of mobilization in August 1914. It was all set up and ready to go. Everyone was waiting for the one order. Father had to report to his battalion. We didn't go all the way to the station with him. We just walked along beside him for a while. I remember father had a small tobacco pipe and he went off in a good mood. Everyone was very enthusiastic at the time. I mean, it was understandable because nobody really knew much about what war actually meant. And off he went, waving his little pipe and saying, we'll be home for Christmas. But the Germans hadn't just triggered their own mobilization. They prompted other nations to do the same. In the arms race that had preceded the First World War, all the major powers had developed rail mobilization plans, elaborate strategies for the movement of troops. By the time of the war, it was almost equally perfect in all countries. You absolutely had to keep up with the Joneses if you were not to be too late on the frontier. And so you got a situation where every move in the mobilization of every country was absolutely dependent on the moves of every other country. Well, that was very exciting for youngsters to get in these cattle trucks. And uh, some of us 
travelled on the roof until they came to a tunnel, came back with black faces. And there was a lot of random firing with our rifles at things in the field as we went by. And sometimes it stopped for a quarter of an hour. Then we'd go up and talk to the engine driver and he'd give us some hot water and then we'd make some tea. Once I walked across to a farm to buy some eggs, but just as I got there, the engine driver went toot toot, so we had to run back and get on. It was quite a picnic travelling up. Millions of men were delivered to the front, and entire industries at home were turned over to supplying all the paraphernalia for the trench warfare that ensued. The railways moved a vast quantity of materials and men constantly. There were shells and trench mortars, there was all the stuff we needed in the trenches, iron pickets and sandbags and, of course, food. Men and arms had never before been moved in such numbers and at such speed. But once they were unloaded from the trains, they formed a static force, restricted by the limits of foot and horsepower. The British brought forward over one million shells for the Battle of the Somme. And obviously, without the railways, they could never have even started the job. But once all those shells were unloaded, once they were dumped in front of the railheads, they could no longer be moved at all. When we arrived out there, there it was, the Western Front, the biggest man-made structure I should think it's ever been, 400 miles long from the Belgian coast to Belfont on the Swiss border. The real had dictated where the front was, and no army was able to operate at more than 20 miles from the railheads if you launch an attack. And even when that attack was successful, once you got beyond that kind of range, you would be stuck. The Western Front barely moved for the whole four years of the war. Instead of the quick victory the Schlieffen plan envisaged, each side bombarded the other, consuming men and arms at a previously unimaginable rate. And as the years wore on, the landscape was chewed up until it resembled nothing on earth. The railways promised a war of movement. What they delivered was the greatest static war in history. As in the American Civil War, what ultimately decided the Great War was the Allies' industrial might. The Germans were overcome by superior supplies, not superior forces. The First World War revealed the railway's limitations. Timetables and fixed lines suited the order of peacetime far more than the chaos of battle. As a new arms build-up began in the 1930s, the motor vehicle promised military campaigns that did not depend on railways. Armoured cars, tanks and trucks were now seen as the vital elements of a mobile military force. But in the Soviet Union, railways were still regarded as essential to any war effort. They'd helped the Bolsheviks to take power and control an empire covering vast distances. Stalin saw the railway as a key part of his military strategy, and Soviet railway workers were left in no doubt of their primary duty. On the smoke box of my engine was written for motherland, and there on the hatch there was a big portrait of Stalin. Here it was for motherland, and there it said for Stalin. Ну, 
выходит. Желаю успеха. Да, знаете, с таким помощником далеко заехать можно. Ну, будьте здоровы, Сашенька! In the 1930s, Hitler revived Germany's armed forces and industry. Germany was building some of the most advanced steam engines in the world. However, as a veteran of World War I, Hitler was skeptical of the military value of railways. He wanted a motorized army and set about building an impressive new road network. Railways did not figure in his plans for German expansion. When Hitler did travel by train, such as on his journeys to Munich, he had a lavish set of carriages maintained as a mobile operations room, complete with personal staff. The chief is Adolf Hitler. The chief was Adolf Hitler. We called him the chief. We never said Führer. We said chief. The train was the Führer's rolling headquarters. This must have been in the first days of the war. Here's the chief with Ribbentrop, the foreign minister. They sat in front of the train and made decisions. I only spoke to him once, even though we carried him and looked after him. If you encountered him on the train, you stepped back, of course, but the only time I was spoken to and asked something directly was this stupid business with the bath carriage. This is an actual plan of the bath wagon, the carriage that derailed. Here you can see the actual bars, three of them, and a hairdresser's salon a sink for hair washing, and a barber's chair. We operated a hotel service for people receiving iron crosses. Coming from the front, they'd need the facilities of the bath carriage. They went for a shave and had a bath. You couldn't go before the chief without a wash and brush up. About 500 meters away from one station, there was a sharp bend. Suddenly there was a terrible noise and we braked. We jumped down to see what happened. The bath wagon, which weighs 81 tons, had derailed. Overnight, the coach was put back on the tracks. During all this activity, Goering graced us with his presence and bought crates of beer for the engineers, and we had to put up with his endless stupid advice. They came looking for me and told me I'd been summoned by the chief, that he had a question for me. I explained the situation and said to him, we're all ready for you to go. And he said, oh, don't bother. We don't need the train to get to Munich. Hitler preferred to travel by road. In 1939, he chose to make his triumphal entrance into Prague in an open-top Mercedes. The swift Nazi invasions or blitzkriegs that started the Second World War were achieved principally by overwhelming tank and air power. But when France fell, Hitler did find one symbolic use for the train. It was in this carriage that the Germans were forced to sign the armistice of November 1918. 22 years later, Hitler insisted on the very same carriage as the location for the French surrender in June 1940. Germany's humiliation was laid to rest.
Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion of Soviet Russia in June 1941, used classic blitzkrieg techniques. 3,000 aircraft, 150 divisions, and 3,500 tanks pushed east at great speed. The Russians were completely taken by surprise. In October 1941, the front line was broken through at Yartsevo, and on the 7th of October, Germans entered Vyazma. We, the ones who were still there, we climbed on the last engine. All of us, about 40 people hanging on, we headed off to Mozaisk. At the Konyanyo junction, there was a destroyed train on the track blocking the way, so we had to abandon the engine and get to Mezorskaya on foot. Then, from Mezorskaya, we continued by train. When the war started, I was on the Bielo-Russian railway at the Gamel depot, which was on the front line. From the first days of war, I was working under fire because our railway was actually serving the battle forces. So all our trains had to be moved in spite of the bombing and shelling. The railways enabled Stalin to buy time with an organized retreat. Orders were given to dismantle entire factories and transport them east of the Ural Mountains, far from the German advance. Workers and equipment were moved to safety. The Russians rebuilt the evacuated factories and kept them working for the war effort. As the weather began to change, the German advance faltered. They had too few trucks to support the lengthening campaign. The railways were needed, but there was one problem. The Russian rails were too far apart for the German trains. Undaunted, the Germans set about regaging entire lines so they could use their own engines and wagons. That is naturally Eine ziemliche Arbeit. Man braucht einige Werkzeuge dazu. Man it is certainly hard work, and you need several tools. So you work a crowbar under the nail and hit it from the other side. The nail flies out. You pick up the nail, and during that time, the rail is pushed inwards. When it's in the right position, you hammer the nail back in first with a small hammer, then with a big rail nail hammer. Naturally, you develop a routine in time. You take the hammer and hit over the rail so that you hit the head of the nail, which is about a square centimeter wide, rather small. Several thousand miles of track was regaged, but it was never enough. There was always a point where the Germans had to change over to captured Russian lines and trains. I came to Russia in 1940 to work on the railways. We started off in the station Grimenschuk, which is in Ukraine. That was as far as the German lines reached. From there on, it was the wide-gauge line leading into Inner Russia. 
it was decided that we had to unload all the trains of the normal gauge to captured Russian wide gauge trains. This led to immense personnel problems. We were using Russian prisoners of war. They had to reload coal by hand without shovels so that it could be sent to the front. In Russia, distances were so large that the German armored forces ran out of steam long before they ever reached their objectives. And so they had to make use of the railways. By September, October, which were the critical months of the Russian campaign, they would need about 120 trains a day in order to keep all the armed force armies in Russia uh, completely supplied. And there were days in which they would get through 30 trains, 40 trains, sometimes not at all. The onset of a severe Russian winter added to the Germans' problems. Their equipment and their training did not allow for the extreme cold which slowed their trains to a halt. The Russians were better prepared. It was impossible to stick your head out of the cab if you wanted to have a look at the track. Your face was immediately frozen, and tears wouldn't let you see anything. But anyway, the front needed coal, and so did industry. So we moved these trains. Nevertheless, by November, German guns could be heard in Red Square. Moscow had to prepare its defences as Hitler ordered a further push onto the Russian capital. Once again, Stalin turned to the railways for help. Thousands of Soviet troops were stationed in the Far East on the alert for a possible Japanese attack. He took the risk of moving 10 divisions along the full length of the Trans-Siberian Railway to the capital. The troops went straight into battle from the trains. It was the first major defeat for the Germans. A key factor was that the Russian railways were under direct military command. As the campaign turned from blitzkrieg to a war of attrition, tensions emerged between the German railwaymen and the German forces. One bad experience I had during the Great Freeze, a trainload of wounded soldiers in open trucks stopped at the station in Grimenchuk, wanting to go through. But we weren't allowed to let it go, because homewards we were only permitted to allow a certain quota through. The wounded were lying on straw in open wagons with serious injuries. The officer in charge wanted to get his patients home. And we weren't allowed to let them move, even though we had locomotives available. We couldn't permit it. The order from above was no more trains homeward. Being a military railwayman under the control of the Red Army, we received orders direct from the chief military command. They sent their orders to the railway directorate, who passed them on to us, the management of the group. And we provided engines for the army trains, the ones that had to go to the front. The famous German planning 
just hadn't worked because they hadn't thought about it. They'd, their assumptions were false, uh, and their assumptions excluded railways as a primary means of supply, whereas the Russians knew damned well that they'd have to rely on railways, partly because they didn't have roads, let alone autobahns, so they knew they'd have to rely on them, which they did absolutely brilliantly. It was a turning point. As in 1914, Germany now faced a long, all-consuming war in which the railways would be crucial. Reichsminister Dr. Goebbels beglückwünscht die ausgezeichneten Eisenbahner. Das heißt heute, einen großen Teil der Kriegsentscheidung in der Hand haben. Only now did railways become central to Germany's war effort. Even the design of engines was now adapted to the demands of war. The Kriegslok, or war locomotive, was a single simple design that could be mass produced. <laughs> Yes, see, look at the boiler. It's all simplified. We didn't use any sheet metals. Everything was reduced. Now, you had all these bars here. They're molded. Before, we would have polished them. Now, we just left them. Here, all the bearings are completely simplified. It's all one piece now straight from the press works. We only needed to give it the finishing touches and assemble it. And the simple reason for doing this, less hours for production, less working hours, faster and more production to get the product out. It was all for the same end. Simplifications cut the time it took to build an engine by almost two-thirds and enabled the job to be done by unskilled workers, prisoners of war and forced labor. Not until 1942, several years after Britain, was Germany's economy fully mobilized for the war effort. Once again, war became a duel of industrial might. As the war persisted, many rail workers were sent to the front. Among those drafted to replace them was a teenage refugee from East Prussia, Gerda Schlotterbeck. It shocked me when I heard that I had to become a railway worker because I had no idea what to expect. All I knew was that trains ran on tracks with an engine at the front. I asked myself what I was supposed to do there. I didn't have a choice. You couldn't choose your occupation. You had to go where you were ordered to. And this is what I did. My father worked for the railway. He repaired tracks, the old wooden tracks that had to be repaired for the war because of the heavy usage. He was a very small man and he had to carry the rails. We were put together in groups of Jewish male workers. We had to carry these potato bags, reload them into vans and send them to other stations. It was at the Stettin station. Hard work, very hard work. The Holocaust really got underway at the same time as the war became total for Germany. That is, in the middle of 1941, when they invaded. From this time on, it was no longer a luxury war. It was a life-to-death war for existence. And under those circumstances, the limits of what you could do, even in Nazi Germany, even to Jews, fell away. Before that, the Germans were concerned to not to antagonize their own people. Whereas under circumstances of total war, as three and a half million uh, German troops battled against 
uh, the Soviet army, as millions and millions of Germans died. 80% of all Germans who died in World War II died in the, on the Soviet front. As their own cities, of course, were being bombed to smithereens. You could do anything. The Berlin suburb of Grunewald is one of the smartest in the city. But during the war, it was from this station that most of the remaining Jews in Berlin were transported by rail to the concentration camps. 50,000 of them. Ja, es ist so schwer, mich nun umzudrehen und es zu zeigen, weil dann sehe ich. Yes, it is hard for me to turn around and show you this place because I can feel the despair again. To see friends arriving in open vans. And you know that there is a train waiting for them, a train of cattle trucks and goods wagons. Knowing what awaits them. Amazingly, many of them didn't realize what was going on. They allowed themselves to be fooled. The SS officers asked, please leave your luggage on the left of the platform. It will be collected by goods wagon. And they did so. Very disciplined and very willingly, so they wouldn't be burdened with it. They had no idea yet that there would be no space for luggage in the cattle wagons. There would be 80 people in each wagon. At that point, I served them soup. And I even met friends of mine. We'd nod and say, see you soon. And they had their soup, something warm to eat, the soup. Then I saw them being pushed inside. The possibilities of railways encouraged two fatal vanities among generals. The first is because they could move troops and supplies so relatively fast and in such enormous quantities, gave them a feeling of omnipotence, that they were chess players. The second, and allied to that, was that because of railways, they could command their troops far from the battlefield. And this gave them a sense of unreality, which I think was an absolute disaster. Now, this feeling of omnipotence and this distancing reached a sort of tragic crescendo in the Holocaust, which, of course, would not have been possible without an extremely efficient railway system. And that is the most tragic and ironic link between railways and the capacity to distance yourself from events, which was one strand in the Holocaust because so few people needed to admit to themselves what they were doing. The surprising thing about the Holocaust is how easy it was. I'll give you some figures. Uh, Six million people are supposed to have been killed in the Holocaust, including some members of my own family uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, out of those six million, probably two million or so were killed on the spot. The rest had to be transported to the various death camps first. Uh, a standard German military train of the time had 55 carriages. We mentioned this before. 50 persons per carriage, actually, you would get in more. But even if you take the standard figures, would be 2,500 persons per train. You could transport the whole 4 million people by this gruesome logic in about 1,600 trains. 
uh, spread over a period of approximately three years from the end of 1941, which is when Auschwitz opened, to the end of 44, when it closed. Approximately one and a half trains a day. This at a time, as we said earlier, when the German forces in Russia alone required over a hundred trains a day in order to keep fully supplied. So, relatively speaking, killing six million people was an easy, very small job. This is one of the amazing things about it. To escape being transported himself, Gat Beck went underground. One refuge he used was the S-Bahn, Berlin's suburban rail network, where there were few Gestapo checks. This way, Beck was able to save himself and many others. Wenn Sie da kommen wir zu einem Kapitel, wo wir der Reichsbahn danken müssen, dass sie Züge auch während des Krieges. We had to be grateful to the railways that the trains ran all night during the war. Those who didn't have a place to hide, especially during summer, took an S-Bahn train to Wannsee. This is quite far away, a 45-minute ride. Sometimes you could stay on the train all the way to Erkner at the other end of the line. You could spend a huge amount of time doing this. Or you could sit at the station and eat sandwiches if there wasn't a train back right away. You could pretend to be a worker coming from a night shift, waiting for a train for another one, one and a half or two hours. Many people spent their nights like this. As the German war effort grew more and more dependent on rail transport, railways became a focus of active resistance. In occupied France, the Germans had come to rely heavily on the SNCF rail network. But it only took a few brave individuals to throw it into chaos. We didn't know at the beginning what we'd have to do. We didn't know there'd be parachute drops. We didn't know we'd have weapons and ammunition. It was quite complicated to start with. I kept this, which arrived in a parachute drop, in one of the British parachute drops. It's information on a greatly reduced card with instructions and the places where we had to perform acts of sabotage. It's written in English, it's minuscule, and it took a lot of patience to translate it and to see what it said, what the instructions were. Louis and Myro's Malat's target was this key depot in Avignon. In the run-up to D-Day in 1944, a campaign of railway sabotage was launched with coded signals broadcast by the BBC. The signal was, the crocodile will eat the tough cow. That was a message. From then on, we had to attack the railway lines and the trains. In order to attack the trains, we had to go into the depot. 22 engines were destroyed. Similar attacks helped paralyze German troops moving against the Allied invasions. Facing onslaughts from east and west, and driven back into their own territory, the Germans feared the railways falling into Allied hands. But the Allied forces were fully motorized. The German railways were of little value except as targets.
One of my jobs was to draw up the train timetables, but they were useless now. It was horrible. During the day, there were always 10 dive bombers in the air. As soon as a train moved, three or four would attack the locomotive. So they moved at night to avoid them. It was a wonder that they moved at all, but even that wasn't possible near the end. As in the American Civil War and the Great War, railways proved both an asset and a liability. Ideal for deployment and supply, but vulnerable and inflexible in the chaos of war. Railways have a tragic place in the history of modern warfare. They dramatically expanded the ambitions of war makers. They promised quick, decisive victories, but delivered long wars and a scale of destruction and carnage never before experienced. Yet the railways did play a heroic role in confronting Nazi aggression, a role which is enshrined in Soviet folklore. I was taking a train from Unyechi to Bryansk. A station master came up to me and told me to come to the phone. They read the decree to me, and it said that they'd made me a hero of socialist labor. I couldn't believe it, because I was the first woman to have this honor. I was invited to come to Moscow, I was given a new uniform, and we went to the Kremlin to receive our stars. There were 30 people receiving medals, station masters, engine drivers, all of them people who'd worked on the lines at the front. Locomotion continues next Saturday. The information revolution is now upon us, but sometimes it's a struggle to keep up. On Wednesday, we begin a new series that brings the world of future technology into your home. Join Graham Phillips for an entertaining armchair ride of discovery in Hot Chips, Wednesday night at 8 o'clock. Shortly on ABC, police drama In the Bill.